In the last video, we solved a pulse integration problem analytically. Now I'm going to show you the more graphical approach. I copied and pasted the function picture from the problem statement just to refresh our memory. Like the analytical method, I'm going to split the integration into three parts because we have three regions. One from 0 to t1, one from t1 to t2, and the last from t2 to t3. Let's start with the first region. When we integrate, we don't know where we're going to be in the region from 0 to t1. We could be here, 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 or anywhere in between. No matter where we are, f1 is always a constant value. That means the integral is just going to be f1 times whatever time value we're at because it's just a rectangle. Notice how we get the same result as the analytical method. The graphical interpretation is that t may be, let's say, here for instance, so the area underneath this curve is just f1, which is the height of our rectangle, times t, which is just the width of our rectangle. Now we're going to do something similar from t1 to t2. We don't know where we're going to be from t1 to t2, but regardless of where we are, we've already covered this entire area over here. We just have to cover the additional area, which is governed by wherever our t is. For example, if t is here, then we also have to account for this area down here. Keep in mind that we already have to account for this area over here, and the area of this entire first rectangle is just f1 times t1. The area in the lower region is just f2 times t minus t1. And this is the same exact result as the analytical approach. Finally, let's look at the last region from t2 to t3. Once we hit t2, we've already integrated the entire area under the first region and the entire area under the second region. Conveniently, the value of f of t from t2 to t3 is just zero, so it actually doesn't matter where in the range from t2 to t3 we are, because the integral will just be the summation of these two areas. And this is the result we get for the third region of i of t. We can put them all together to form one cohesive expression for i of t. You can write i of t using the Heaviside step function if you want, but I did that in the last video, so I'll just give you this bracketed expression instead. The last part of the problem wants us to plot both f of t and i of t on two different subplots. Here we are in MATLAB. This is a pretty simple script, there's really nothing fancy about it. In the first section, I input the system parameters which are given to us in the problem statement. The one very important thing is line 13 in the old param equals simpref heaviside origin one statement. If you read the documentation, the heaviside function by default sets the value of h of 0 equal to 0.5, not 1. What line 13 does is that it sets h of 0 equal to 1 instead of the value 0.5. Once you run this line, the heaviside function will be affected more or less permanently. However, you can undo this change by uncommenting the following line and issuing the simpref equals heaviside origin, comma, old param line. The next part of the script creates f and i, both as anonymous functions, and then creates a subplot and plots them. I use the heaviside function to represent them because I think this is a much more mathematically rigorous way. You'll see one minor discrepancy between what I have coded and what we did by hand. We see that i of t in the last part says f1 times t1 plus f2 times t2 minus t1, but then the quantity inside the heaviside step function is missing heaviside of t minus t3 right after this statement. I did this to make the plot look cosmetically good because we only are plotting up to 3 seconds. If we plotted more than 3 seconds, then I would include the heaviside of t minus t3, but when you include the heaviside of t minus t3 and only plot for 3 seconds, then it kind of screws up the very last point on the plot, which I don't really want for this problem. When we run the code, we can see the plot pops up. 
we can qualitatively check the shapes of I of t and f of t. For example, we know that I of t is a diagonal line from 0 to 1, so the derivative of I of t from 0 to 1 should just be some positive value as a straight line, which we see as f of t here. Likewise, the slope from 1 to 2 of I of t is negative, so f of t will take on a negative constant value. And lastly, I of t doesn't change from the region 2 to 3, which is why the value of f of t is 0 throughout. I hope this gave you a better understanding of these types of integration problems. See you next time.